Good evening. It is wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. We are going to begin with a brief prayer. If you could join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, please be with us here this evening. Please be with Maggie as she shares her wisdom with us. And be with each one of us as we open our hearts to hear what she has to share with us. We pray for ease of memory and eloquence of speech for Maggie and peace for all those here tonight. And we ask for the intercession of Mary as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Elizabeth Burkhart, and I am a catechesis of the Good Shepherd Catechist here at St. Jerome, as well as the Assistant Montessori Director. And it is my great pleasure to introduce St. Jerome Academy's new Montessori Director, Maggie Radzik. Maggie comes to us with all three levels of catechesis of the Good Shepherd training, as well as all three levels of Montessori training from the Association of Montessori International. She also has several years, met, sorry, many years of teaching experience at several different AMI Montessori schools, and she was head of two AMI Montessori schools across the East Coast. We are just thrilled to have her joining us here at St. Jerome. And so without further ado, I introduce to you Maggie Radzik. Thank you. I hate introductions. I feel like it sets you up for <laughs> huge expectations. Um, but hopefully I leave that up to the Holy Spirit. I just want to share a quick story um, with how I came to St. Jerome's recently. Um, I had met Chris Curry several years ago at a series of talks I was invited to give at um, Our Lady of Lourdes? St. Bernadette's in Silver Spring. <laughs> um, and then they, a, a few weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, um, Chris had asked if I would come and just have a discussion about the Montessori program here at St. Jerome's. And I have to say that the second I walked in the door, I just felt this incredible spirit. And I thought, wow, this, I wonder what I'm feeling, you know? And I had to wait a while to, before I talked to um, Chris and Andrea. And I was sitting out in front of the office and I saw our Lady Guadalupe and I thought, okay, that's probably part of it. But the adults that were passing by and the older children that were going by, I was on that middle level, everybody was smiling. The, none of the adults looked stressed and it was toward the end of the year. The children were freely going up and down the hall and there wasn't an adult saying, you know, where's your hall pass? What are you doing out here? There was just this wonderful feel. And I thought, wow, this, there's something special here. So then, you know, we had our meeting, we talked, and it was nothing about um, employment here at all. But as I was driving home my, from here, my mother, who passed a number of years ago, and I know is in heaven, I had a very holy mother, have a very holy mother. Ever since she's passed, she gives my brother and my sister and I bluebirds as a symbol. She will just send bluebirds from time to time when we're you know, in moments of crisis or in moments of decision. Well, I headed down that street where St. Jerome's was on the right, and there's a eight-foot bluebird statue in somebody's yard. And I, I hit the brakes, and I went, what? And I looked at the statue to make sure I was seeing, and there's nothing else on the street. Nobody else has a bluebird statue in their yard. There's this giant, so I took a picture of it, and I sent it to my sister, and she immediately texted back, wow, what does mom have you doing now? I said, I, you know, I don't know. And then as a couple of weeks went on, well, now I'm here. And I, I really, I couldn't be more thrilled. I, I just, you know, I'm convinced it's from the Holy Spirit. So. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I can't wait to meet all of you. I know it's going to take time. But um, when I talked to Chris and Danny, I said, you know, the one thing over the years that I, I've been teaching Montessori, this will be my 28th year in Montessori. I, I taught traditional education before that. But what kept coming up over the years is for the new parents, before going into the summer, 
what were some things that we could be doing in the home that would really help our child when they entered in the fall? So that's what I'd like to focus on tonight. There's the, the Montessori discoveries, everything that she found out are, you know, there's volumes of it, so it, it would take years. And we are going to have a whole series of parent nights um, throughout the year to share this knowledge with you if you want to come. But tonight I hope to go right to the heart of the matter and have enough time for a question and answer um, after I present just, just a little bit. So if I could just see a show of hands of who is brand new to St. Jerome's, like I am. Oh, wow, great. There's a lot of us. Okay, okay, good. Um, and how many are um, have children under the age of six that are here? Great. Okay, great. So for many people who are brand new to this, they might not know. I know this is a tiny picture. There's not one here. Many people don't know that Dr. Maria Montessori was a person they, because the Montessori word is all over there. She, she was the first woman to become a doctor in Italy um, around the 1870s. And she um, was born in a tiny town in Italy. And very early, her teacher saw that she had genius intellect. So they told her parents, you should move her to Rome so that she can take advantage of you know, the better school system there. So they did, and when she was 16, um, she wanted, decided she wanted to be an engineer. She was, had an incredible uh, gift with math. So no man had been in, admitted to the engineering, I mean, no woman had been admitted to the engineering program, so it took her a little while and her father was pretty upset with that. She started out in engineering, and then after a couple of years, she was walking home through the streets of Rome and she saw a gypsy woman with six or seven children bathing her children in a fountain that was common back then. And the horse and buggies were going up and down. It was all the hustle and bustle, people walking by. But she noticed the little toddler about this age sitting outside the fountain with a piece of red string. And this toddler was focusing on this piece of red string with his whole personality. Just you know, w ignoring everything else. And she said, I, I don't know if I stopped for 30 seconds or 30 minutes, but in that moment, I was given my vocation. And I knew I had to pursue becoming a medical doctor. So that was unheard of for a woman to be admitted to medical school. It took her four years. She kept applying and applying and applying. And finally, the president of the medical school said, will you not stop? bothering me and she said no I won't I know this is what I'm supposed to do so eventually he accepted her but because she was the only woman they wouldn't allow her to dissect the cadavers and have the same classes as the men typically so she would have to come back at night and go into the basement alone with a lantern you know this is before electric lighting and dissect cadavers by herself and the, the smell of the formaldehyde would cause her to pass out so someone told her, if you take up cigar smoking, that'll drown out the smell of the formaldehyde. So they have these drawings of her with this giant stogie in her mouth and a scalpel, cutting open dead bodies. But that, that was her, she knew that was her calling, that was her passion. So she ended up graduating top of the class. Her graduation picture is wonderful. She's in the middle. She was the valedictorian with all these men around her. And then she went on to um, become a surgeon, uh, never wanted to have anything to do with education. And she said that many times to her teachers, which basically nursing and education was, was all that was open to women at the time. And she said, oh, no, no, I'll never be a teacher. So a few years after graduation, it was at the time when they were just starting to do work with severely mentally retarded children. They, they called them idiot children or defective children back then. And they had them all in a hospital together, emotionally disturbed, psychically disturbed, physically handicapped. They just, you know, it was right at the beginning of all this. And they asked if she would work with them. And she said, you know, she really wasn't interested in it. But one of her colleagues said, just go look at them, just observe. So she went to observe, and it was like a, a glass window like that, and she looked in on these children, and the nurse said, watch what happens after I push their food through. So people didn't even bring the food through. There was a slot in the wall, and they were just sliding the trays of food in for these children. The nurse said, watch. They, they throw themselves on the floor afterwards, and they grovel around like animals to eat the crumbs. 
And so she watched through the window and she noticed they weren't eating the crumbs. They definitely threw themselves on the floor, but they were taking the crumbs for tactile experience. They were lining them up, they were trying to build with the crumbs, and she looked around their room and she saw there was nothing in their room for them to work with. Their, their heads were shaved because of lice. They were basically prisoners and they just had, you know, cots that they were laying on. So the two men, uh, the two doctors, Etard and Sagan, who, Dr. Etard is the one who found the wild boy of Aveyron who had been raised by wolves. And he had been doing lots of experiments with him and um, she went to study their work. And even though they had all of their notes printed and you know you could just get their books, she said, no, I want to hand copy your notes. Because even then, she knew the importance of muscular memory. So she spent a year hand copying all of their notes, went back to Rome, worked with these children in this orthophrenic clinic for one year, and then said to the Minister of Education in Rome, I'd like these children to sit for the regular state school exams that you give to children of their same age. He said, well, that's crazy, but you're the most famous woman in Europe right now. Okay. So they administered the exams, and every child in that clinic did as well or better than the children in the normal state schools. So he called her a miracle worker. He held a press conference. He said, we have another great Italian amongst us. Michelangelo, Dante, you know, and now what did you do that was, you know, so incredible that brought these children up in one year? And she looked at him and she said, no, what are you doing so wrong in the traditional school system that's holding normal children back so far? And he was, you know, <laughs> but that was pretty much her, her way of being. She was very, you know, kind of cut right to it. What, what's going on in the traditional school system that they're not progressing if these children could do this in one year? So he asked her to go observe and she did. She observed several days in a factory model school and she came out and said, I feel as though I've just seen butterflies pinned to a board. Children who are intended to move, that were being forced to sit in the desk, not being able to use their hands, the only thing they had in front of them was a textbook. And so this set her on her path. Um, she had to wait seven years to work with what was termed normal children. So then that's a beautiful story. I'll have to make that very short, but it was, it was the poorest of the poor in Rome at the time. They were immigrants that had been pouring into Italy for several years, and they were living in the streets, living in cardboard boxes. And the, um, the city workers started building apartment buildings just to hold these, these immigrants in. So the parents would go out 12 to 14 hours a day trying to find work. They, a lot of them were prostitutes, a lot of them were criminals. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of written about that early time. And so they were looking for a babysitter to stay with these children in the basement of each building. And Dr. Montessori jumped at the chance and her colleagues couldn't believe it. They said, you're known all over the world now for being a genius, being the first woman doctor in Europe. And, you know, and she said, I, this is what I need. I need to see these children. So she set up the room for these 60 children. That was um, January 6, 1907. And she took a notebook and a pencil, hired two women to work with them, and sat in the back of the room. And she said, in my heart, I said to them, said to the children, show me who you are. Because she had no idea what to expect. She didn't, she never wanted to be involved in education. But, she, you know, from that one experience with the idiot children, she knew there was great potential with the child. So what she saw was very early on, she started, and she just sat and observed, she started noticing that every time an adult came into that environment of these 62 children to cook or to clean or to um, fix the plumbing or whatever, you know, gardening, the children would gather around that adult and say, me help, me help. And she thought, oh, that's sweet, you know. But then it kept happening and happening, and she thought, well, what's preventing them from helping the adult? And she identified two things. It was the attitude of the adult. Most adults would say, you go play. This is adult work. And then also that there were no tools to, that were the size of a child's hand. So she met with some artisans in Rome. She had real tools fashioned that were not you know, Fisher Price, but real metal and wood tools that worked. 
And she started putting these out on the shelves, gardening tools, cooking tools, mops, and brooms. And she noticed that the children started choosing these materials over the toys that were in the room. And she was fascinated by it. And she, she watched many times. And in fact, there was, you know, she didn't believe it. She kept saying, I'll believe it the next time. So day after day, she's observing. And in fact, there was one little girl mopping the floor. And she went over and she said, come play with me at the dollhouse. It was a four and a half year old girl. And it was this beautiful dollhouse. She had many wealthy friends that had donated beautiful toys. So she thought, that's what children do. They want toys. She brought the girl over to the dollhouse. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, the girl looked at her and said, Dr. Montessori, are you quite through? I'd like to go back to my mopping now. And Montessori thought, hmm. You know, and, and she wrote it down. And, but what she started noticing is, I, I think, one of her greatest discoveries. She noticed that as the children were choosing these tools for cooking or cleaning or they would get engaged with whatever apparatus, whatever the material was, a broom, a mop, you know, spooning, cleaning the windows, and it would cause them to repeat the action over and over again, whether or not the window was clean or not. And she thought, that's fascinating that they're repeating this, this movement. Then she noticed that at some point, after a repetition, they would just drop the tool and go on to something else. So this led her to say that and, and I, we're going to get to this whole chart in a minute, but my favorite discovery that she made is she said, I see now that the human family is divided into two poles of humanity. The pole of childhood and the pole of adulthood. and they meet each other in a physical environment. The home, the school, the church. And that each pole of humanity had its work to do. But what she saw is that adults didn't understand that the young child from zero to six is in the period of self-construction. We'll talk about this, these four planes of human development in a minute. But she saw that from conception to the age of between six and seven was the most important period in a human person's life. She said the great work of man is to build a self and that's what happens in these early years. The child, I, I like to say to parents, remember your child as a newborn, and then think of that same child at the age of three. That's a completely different being. Now we know, you know, Montessori said, at, at three, life begins again. Now we know from all of the brain research that's been done in the last 40, 50 years, 90% of our brain is formed in the first three years of life, 90%. The remaining 10% is formed by the age of eight. The first three years of life are critical to the rest of our years. And she saw that the way this self-construction, the way this brain development is, is brought about is through work. But what does the work of the child look like? It looks like this. I love that we have this example in front. It's through movement, it's through purposeful engagement in the environment. St. John Paul II said, we define work as any activity that is beneficial to man. Dr. Montessori defined it the same way. Children in the first three years of life are almost constantly moving. And now we know from, and it was NIH who discovered it right down the road, the more a child moves in the first three years of life, the heavier and the stronger their brain. She said we should almost never subdue a child's movement unless it's for safety or for, now, you know, we, there, we can do a lot of nights about the containers that we put children in and, you know, what children want is to move and when they're allowed to move, they're happy and they want purposeful movement, they want coordinated movement. 
But what she saw with this, the two works that adulthood and childhood both have their work to do, she said the adult works to change the environment and to better the environment. We work to make money. We work to clean our houses. We work for an external goal. The child works for an internal goal. That's why they will take up a broom or a mop or a squeegee and a spray, and they will do it over and over and over, and then they'll just drop it. Their intention is not to get the dishes clean or not to clean the floor. They have an internal purpose that's very mysterious to the adult. An adult would never sweep and sweep and sweep a clean floor. We wouldn't do that. We do it for the purpose of cleaning the floor. And they will get, they, the child gets to that around the age of six and a half or seven. But in the early years, they're doing it to build themselves for, for self-construction. And this, I, I think, is probably one of the most misunderstood parts of childhood, I think, in the United States today. Um, I, I was privileged to be with the Missionaries of Charity, um, part of a retreat for them, a few years ago. And there was a sister there, Sister John Biani from Kenya. She was just incredible. And at the end of six days of Montessori theory, she stood up and she said, now I understand why my village is so different from the United States. And you know, I said, please tell us. She said, in my village, there's no plumbing, there's no electricity. It's a, the families have very large families, 12, 14, 16 children. But she said, I never saw a temper tantrum until I moved to the United States. Although children cried in her village, she said, I never saw this, what you all call a temper tantrum. And she said, now I know why. Because the minute the children in our village can stand, the adults say, yes, come gather firewood with me. Yes, when the hand goes on the spoon, help me stir the pot. Yes, help me. She said their, their need for work is satisfied. They, children play. Dr. Montessori said, identified that, that play is natural to the human person. The adult never has to inspire the child to play. What we have to do is slow down our work when we see that they have interest in what we're doing. When they see, you know, she said even from the very beginning, when they start helping us take the diaper off, our attitude should be, yes, cooperate with me. Yes, help me take the diaper off. Yes, help me put your socks on. Let's do it together. Rather than one of control, she said these two poles of humanity were intended to exert a reciprocal influence upon one another. And when one controls the other, if the adult is controlling the child, or if the child is allowed to control the adult, there's not harmony within the human family. That's not how it was intended to be. But when they're exerting a reciprocal influence, when the adults are opening themselves to the formation that the child has to give, then there's harmony. And she said that that's what I think most adults don't realize is that God has sent children to us to bring us back to our spiritual childhood. And if we think of the words of our Lord, one of the strongest words, you know, strongest statements in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, unless you turn and become like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's really strong. Not you might not, you shall not. Unless you turn and become like a child. So there has to be something there that we need children to show us what that means. What, what does true childhood mean? Montessori saw that there had been a whole tome of literature written about the unnormalized child. The child that was unhappy that since the Industrial Revolution. The normalized child, when given work and allowed to work and not interrupted, is a happy, peaceful child. All parents want happy, peaceful children, right? Most of the time they're happy when they're given these opportunities for work. So we, we want to look a little bit tonight about what that work means and, and the adult attitude towards that work. Dr. Montessori's life, I think, is fascinating. Um, 
she very early on caught the attention of the famous people of her time, Sigmund Freud, Eric Erickson, um, several kings and queens came to her training. Sigmund Freud said to her after listening to several of her lectures, um, Dr. Montessori, if you spread this method, you will put me and my colleagues out of business. And that's exactly what we want. We'd like to, you know. And, and she said uh, the best title for her school should be Centers for Healthy Psychological Development. But not many parents would put their children <laughs> into a place called Centers for Healthy Psychological Development. But it's because it follows the nature of the child that, that it works. At the end of her life, two days before she died, um, she was speaking at a convent in London, and a sister asked her, what would you say is your most important discovery over these 50 years of observation of children? And she said, I would say it would have to be my discovery of the development of the human person from conception to 24. So I just want to do a brief overview of this. She saw that she really challenged the prevailing notion of the time that the human person was born and just got better and better and better throughout our lives. She said, I see that the human person goes through four very distinct phases of development and that each phase of development has its own characteristics, it needs its own environment, and it needs its own response from the adult, uh, optimum response from the adult. So the, the first plane of development is conception to the age of reason, somewhere between age six and seven. The second plane is six to 12, the third is 12 to 18, and 18 to 24. And within each plane of development are two subplanes. There's like a waxing and a waning. She drew these colors and she drew the first plane and the third plane bright flaming red because those are the periods of the most um, growth and creative um, change within the human person. So like I was saying before, the, the infant from birth to age three, look at how much change happens. And then from three to six, there's like a solidifying of what was taken in at, at um, zero to three. Six to 12 is a steady, even period of growth. There's not a lot of change. If you think of your six and a half year old and your 11 year old, really all they've done is grow you know, in size. But from young child to, to older child, there's a huge change. The permanent teeth come in, the hair gets coarse, they get tall and lanky, they're not so cute anymore, they don't have those chubby cheeks, you don't want to just, you know, hug them. <laughs> and she said, this is the period that they want to step outside of the home. So the goal for this, human, this period of development is the development of the social self. This is when they want to know how to be outside of the home. Montessori said, really, before the age of six and a half or seven, they do not need an independent social life because they're still building the self. They're not able to give up self. They can't share yet. They can't find, you know, deeply express their gratitude or their remorse. That's why we don't expect them to say please or thank you. We can make them say the words, but feeling gratitude or feeling remorse is a movement of the soul. They can't match all that up till around the age of reason, six and a half or seven. After that period then, there's a whole nother rebirth. Montessori said childhood ends at 12. And now we have a young adult. And for how many centuries is, you know, did people get married at 13, 14, 15? This is early adulthood. Now the body changes. They become... Um, young adults, it, it's a, it's a, she said this birth is only second to the first birth. She called 12 to 15 the second infancy. And she would tell mothers, if you have a 13 year old and you have a one year old, you have the same child. <laughs> because they are all, they become very self focused again. In this plane of development, she said we see the, the invisible arm of the child go up to the parents. And it's as though they're pushing away from the family. And she said, who's our example of this but our Lord? What did he do at 12? He, he went away for Mary and Joseph and didn't tell them where he was going for three days. It said they sought for him with great anxiety. And then when they found him, and she said, son, why didn't you tell us where you were? And he said, well, didn't you know? I had to be about my father's work. I'm, you know, he needed to enter into adult work. 
And then it says, Mary and Joseph understood not a word he said to them. So I always love, I love to tell parents that of 12 year olds, if Mary and Joseph weren't supposed to get it, you're not supposed to get it. Just know that at 16, <laughs> but for 12 to 15, she said what they want now is other adults in the community. They want other adults telling them the same story that their parents have told them. They want other adults saying, ah, you know, I see. You're a young adult, come join in my work. And this is the, she said they need very few peers at this age, which if we think of our, you know, typical junior highs with 50 and 60 in a class, they really want to know what it means to be an adult. And she said, if we look back to all the primitive cultures, they all had a celebration at this age. It was a rite of passage into adulthood around age 12. Then at 18 to 24, this is parallel to the second plane of development. It's another period of great intellectual growth, not great physical growth. Really the only thing that changes is maybe a few inches in height and the wisdom teeth come in. And then she said at 24, 25, you're fully an adult and now you're ready to give back. So the, the goal for the third plane, sorry I should have done that, is um, the development of the adult self the adult identity. And the fourth plane is the period of vocation. How do I give back? What am I called to do in this life? Each of these planes has certain characteristics and capacities that, that allow us to reach these goals. And we could spend a lot of time, but I, just going to try and do very briefly the first plane child, since that's what most of you are in the midst of. The, the primary characteristic of the first plane child is what she termed the absorbent mind. She wrote a book with this title. And this is to contrast the to the reasoning imaginative mind. That comes on around six and a half or seven. This absorbent mind is really incredibly fascinating. <laughs> The absorbent mind, she, she, she made an analogy between the absorbent mind and the reasoning mind. She said the absorbent mind is like the work of a camera, a, a camera like when I was growing up <laughs> that had film and you, you, know, you need a dark room time. But that the absorbent mind in one click took in everything within its environment. Where she said the reasoning mind is more like an artist at an easel who has to study something to put it on his painting. The young child, it doesn't matter what's in their environment, they take it in in one click. She said the absorbent mind is an, a non-judgmental mind. Whatever is in the environment, the child receives as right and good. They don't sit back and say, hmm, now mom probably shouldn't have said that to dad. Or, you know, my sibling, whatever happens, they, it just, it, it, they receive it. Not only do they receive it, it builds the brain mind. That's what's fascinating. That when the child is born, at the moment of birth, if, if this is a, a neuron, a brain cell, each brain cell has these dendrites, right, that come off of it. And we have billions and billions of neurons. And the dendrites are, are reaching out, and we want them to reach out. There's one thing that causes the dendrites to extend and reach out to the other dendrites. Does anybody know what that is? I love this. There's one thing that makes every dendrite in the baby's brain go like that after birth. Anybody know? You know, you've heard this talk before. I know, but I'm totally Okay, <laughs> it's the mother's face. Isn't that beautiful? Every time the newborn child sees the mother's face, the dendrites explode. And we know this, we've known this for years. They put these electrodes all over the baby's head right after birth, they even do it in utero now. Every time the infant 
in the, in the first year of life, gazes on the mother's face, the dendrites go crazy. So as the dendrites are seeking, are, are reaching out, every time they get close to one another, they're wanting to make a permanent connection called a synapse. Once that synapse is made, that's a permanent connection and it forms the neural highway within the brain. Well, these synapses only happen with repeated activity. So every time a baby goes like this, or every time they reach for the mother's ear, or every time they turn and they gaze at the mother's eye, that repeated activity, those dendrites, I've, Dr. Bruce Perry, if you're really into brain research, I love, Dr. Bruce Perry is the foremost brain expert in our country. You can just Google him and see everything he's discovered. The dendrites are reaching out to make that synapse, but it doesn't happen all at once. It's repeated activity. Then f and for every child at every moment, it's a different amount of repetition. But at some point, it, it makes a connection. At a Montessori conference, he showed this video, and we all jumped out of our seats and went crazy when we saw that connection made. So this is why when a young child is repeating an activity, especially in the first three years of life, we don't interrupt it. If the child is at a, at a light switch, you know, a mother's holding a child near a light switch and they turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. We just wait until they stop. If they, you know, anything that's not dangerous, because the, it's an inner need. They're not choosing to do that. The, the life force within them that God gave them is trying to form their brain. So every time a child you know, does a puzzle or is reaching out for a rattle over and over or, you've all, or trying to get the toe in the mouth you know, when they're so limber, when they're so little, we want to encourage that activity. We don't want to interrupt it because serious brain development is happening. So this absorbent mind, as I said, is a non-judgmental mind. It receives whatever the parents do as right and good. And so Dr. Montessori said, this is why it's so difficult to root out in a person if they have lived racism or sexism or spousal abuse or self-abuse in the early years. They receive that as that's how it is. That's how men treat women or that's how women treat men or that's how I ought to be taught. They don't think about it. It becomes the fabric of their brain. So yes, we can change later, but it's hard. It takes a lot of work. I mean, I know every adult in here, I think you'd all raise your hands. Think of how hard it is to change a habit. It's hard, it takes a lot of effort. They won't have to do that if we're surrounding them with goodness. You know, if we're really putting them in these beautiful, good environments. She also said, the absorbent mind is a reality-based mind. We could spend a lot of time on this. The young child cannot distinguish between what is real and what is not real. To them, everything is real. Dr. Montessori said the young child is born in love with the world what they want is what has been created for them. The ants, the birds, the bees, the trees, they are fascinated by nature, by what is real. And naturally, the young child does not seek out fantasy. There's a time for fantasy, and that comes with the age of reason. At the age of reason, the child can clearly distinguish between what is real and what is not real. So she said, let's follow the child. That was her, her number one statement, follow the child. God has made the human person so good. We are so good, we are sparks of the divine. And she says in The Child in the Church, this is my favorite book by her, that God has put certain laws for our development within us. And when we respect those laws, things go well. When we work against those laws, we have conflict. So this reality-based mind, in, in 1933, she said, the United States will be the last place to adopt this Montessori way of being with children because of their addiction to fantasy. And that was even before Walt Disney. 
right? You know, this, this way of, I mean, that was the big time of frightening children with the German fairy tales, you know, frightening them into being good. Children are good. What we have to do, and, and I'm going to stop after this and take some questions if there are any, is remove the obstacles for their development. Montessori, as she went along, shared with the spiritual director that she said, I've always struggled with the line in the gospel, suffer the little children to come to me and hinder them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And the spiritual director said, well, let's look at the root word of suffer. Sephore means, one of, the, one, of the one of the definitions is to remove the obstacles. So she said, then I started to read that passage remove the obstacles and the children will come to me. And then she started praying about what is the greatest obstacle in a child's life? And she said, it's us. It's the adult who doesn't know child development, who doesn't know how simple and essential they are. They don't need a lot of toys. They don't need praise for every action they do. They, they need our affirmation for who they are always. They need to know the minute they walk into the room, they are loved and delighted. In. Whether or not they ever throw something in the trash or whether or not they ever poop in the potty or, you know, all the things. They need to know they are loved throughout their whole being, just like God the Father loves us. We need to transmit that love to the child. And that changes everything. They believe what we tell them about themselves. Are you telling me I've talked enough? I think I have. <laughs> I think you're right. I think I'll stop for a little bit before doing maybe a few characteristics of the other, just to see if there's any comments, questions. Um, especially over the summer, one of the obstacles to a child's development is screen time. And we know that now. If, if you want the, the, uh, all the science on it, um, Dr. Jane Healy, any of her books? And then right now, currently at UVA, um, Dr. Angeline Lillard. Any screen time before the age of eight is detrimental to the child's brain development. Any screen time. The, the first time the American Medical Association altered their medical findings, do you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> yeah. It never happened before, was screen time. They found, and it, it, it's not theory, it's absolutely proven fact that when a child is exposed to the screen, their brain stops developing. So the AMA came out and said no screen time before the age of six or seven. Parents went crazy. They went absolutely crazy. And so they revised their medical findings, their research findings, and they said, okay, before the age of two. Why would they do that? Why would you do that to parents who are trying to do the right thing? Yes, that's a hard habit to break. And I've known how many hundreds of parents have said, oh man, what would I do without the, you know, but, well, and I've also known lots of parents who have said, you know what, it took two days. That was it. My child cried and complained for two days, and then all of a sudden, they were doing interesting things again when they took the screen time away. So I would just ask you to think about it. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what the, the, hard, and the hard facts are. If you want your child to you know, develop to their full potential, they don't need the screen before the age of eight. There have been lots and lots of articles by all the guys in the Silicon Valley and women who are the developers of all this technology. They do not give it to their children. It's fascinating. They've written so many articles from Montessori schools. They do not let their children have what they have invented until much later in their lives. And they, they said they're not the ones promoting it. It's somebody else. I, I, I don't even need to get into all that. But, but it, it's in their home. Steve Jobs didn't let his own children have his technology. 
because it's just known. It's known. And really, as Montessori teachers, I don't know, maybe, maybe other preschool and kindergarten teachers as well, we can tell in five minutes when a child comes into the classroom how much screen time they've had. We can tell instantly. I've had children pick up a wooden block and say, how do I turn it on? <laughs> that is tragic. What, they had no idea what to do with a wooden block. I've, I've also had a four and a half year old boy pick up a sponge and say, SpongeBob? SpongeBob? I said, no. You know, he, he really didn't know what a sponge was. It's, that's tragic. And, and then, you know, well, we were going to call They crave reality. One of my favorite stories, a little boy, when he came for his tour, this was a number of years ago, he was just over four. He didn't want to come into the classroom for his, his 15 minute tour. He just you know, sat in the doorway with his arms folded. And, and I said, okay, I'll take your mom on the tour. I said, you can stand there. So I took the mother around and I spoke very loud, you know, pointing out everything to his mom. And at the end of the tour, the mother came over and said, would you like to ask Miss Maggie anything? And he kind of, you know, looked up at his mom and he walked into the middle of the room and he looked around the room and he pointed to the iron and he said, that doesn't get hot, does it? And I said, it does. If it didn't get hot, it wouldn't get the wrinkles out of our clocks. And he slowly looked around the rest of the room and he said, what else in here is real? I know, it broke my heart. I said, George, everything in here is real. The scissors cut, the needles are sharp, the glass breaks, it's all real. And he threw his arms around his mom and hugged her and he, every day he came in, he was an incredible worker. And come to find out, he'd been surrounded by plastic and play. That's not what he wanted. He wanted real work. He's out of high school now and he's doing great stuff in college. You know? But every child wants that. They just accept what the parents give. It's, we need to really observe our children. Observe to see what, what they're desiring and then slow down our actions and invite them into our work. Any other, other questions? Yeah. So obviously, screen time is a good thing to avoid, but then you have to have something for your children to do. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have sort of a two-part question. One is, what are some ideas that you think are some of the best use of their time of what to do? And the second follow-up is, might one of those be, like, what do you think of audio books, music, you know, audio sort of options? So, like, mm -hmm. so Okay. I think reading aloud, human, is, is better than right. audio, but I, I think that's better than putting someone else's imagination into an undeveloped brain. So that, it, at least, they're not seeing a picture. Right. Um, as often as you can read to your child, then, you know, I mean, obviously, that's better. Um, I would say lots of movement, lots of time in nature. You know, the new disorder is nature deficit disorder. All you have to do is walk outside and go in your yard. You know, it's, it doesn't mean a huge outing. Just go outside. Dr. Montessori said every time we step outside, something's different. The grass has grown. The leaves are a little different. The birds are, you know, nature never disappoints. And there's a direct connection to how long the child stays outside each day and sleep disorders. I can't tell you the parents that have said to me, oh my gosh, Maggie, you were right. Now that we've had her outside three hours, she slept through the night. The, their brains are developing so fast in this time. They need stimulation. Nothing will stimulate their brain more than nature. Just look around this room, four walls. And then think of what's outside with all of the shapes and the sounds, and that stimulates their brain far more than being indoors. Um, reading aloud to them, reading reality-based books. You know how children want the same book over and over. They love that repetition. Giving them a love of reading. Um, and there are plenty of beautiful reality-based books that are out there. It, you know, if you, uh, Shirley Hughes is an author that's great. Um, Patricia McLaughlin is a great one. Um, I'm sure probably a lot of you have these, these great books. But allowing them the movement that they need to. I, I'm, I'm going to Rochester in a couple of days and I'll be with a, a new mom. Her child's almost three. 
And about six months ago, I said, what's your advice for you know, new parents now that you've been doing this? And she said, just when you think you've given enough movement, give more. Because they, they are, they're constantly developing and it's only in purposeful, meaningful interaction with their environment that they're going to be satisfied. With. It's following their nature. Yeah, that's great. Um, within the zero to six year old, there are certain sensitive periods, and we'll be looking at that in the fall. One of the sensitive periods is order. The young child, because they're taking in millions, literally millions of impressions every day, everything is new to them. All language is new to them. They're, they need physical order, and they need schedule within their day so that they can make mental order. So as much as you can keep things the same, you know, we eat breakfast in the same place. Breakfast isn't on top of the dryer one day and then in the car the next day. And then that's very disorienting to the child and it literally stops their brain development because they have to now orient themselves to this new experience where when they can count on things, their brain can go toward other, you know, matter. So just keeping a simple schedule and when the schedule can't be kept, we tell them. Normally we eat at the or whatever the you know. Normally we do this, but today we're having to do this. Rearranging the furniture or changing the child's room around. They should be present. I can't tell you the number of parents who said they, they didn't sleep for three months because we rearranged the room when they weren't there. They have no idea how that happened. You know, if one parent can hold the child while it's happening, I remember one mother redoing the living room while the baby was there. No, no, look, look, and look what I did. And she redid it. Because the child woke up from nap and just fell into a fit, you know, at looking at the living room. We take all of this for granted because we're developed. Our brains are so different. Everything is new for them. So if we just prepare them and know that usually what they're reacting out of is a, is a disorder in their environment. I, I had a family in one of my toddler classes, they were German, and they spoke German at home. And I guess the parents had said to the child, like, this is our family language. Well, then over the summer, they flew to Germany. Well, on the plane, everybody was speaking German. <laughs> the child was crying and crying and crying, and the mother's trying to console her. And finally, after hours, the child said, I didn't know we had so many people in our family. <laughs> you know, and the mother didn't get it, but my mother, she went, oh. <laughs> that spoke that language in her environment. So now all of a sudden, everybody's speaking that. If we just step back and say, okay, wait, something's out of order, and it can be something so minute. Montessori has so many stories of a little child. Um, you know, if, if we really observe, we'll see that they react for a reason. You know, children don't just cry. They don't just have a tantrum. There's a reason behind it. And if, if we get in the habit of trying to figure it out, also, with, with the order and, and the day, we give too much. You know, Dr. Montessori said three toys is it. Three toys on the shelf. That's all really a child needs. And when they stop playing with one of them, we rotate something else in. We give too much, and then it breaks their concentration. And I, I would love to, well, we want to talk tonight, but to get to the psychic principles of concentration and independence, Concentration is normal to the human person, but we don't know as adults, so we continually break it. If the child isn't on a floor bed and they're in a crib, they're dependent on the adult to come in. If, if, if you parent Montessori, they're on a floor bed, so that when the child wakes up, they crawl out of their bed, they go over to their shelf, they take a book, they take... My best friend who has seven children who got me into Montessori, all of hers have been on a floor bed. And every time I've been with her, I'm so amazed at how long the babies are awake before they call out to be with mom or dad. And, and just a few weeks ago in Ave, I was with the Focus student, if you know what Focus is. The, the married couples are there, and this mom raised her hand and said, oh my gosh, since we've been here in Florida, my child's been on the floor bed. He's so happy. He wakes up and he can get something to do. The only reason they cry or call out is because they can't get out of the crib. But if we make their room safe, and you know, there's a whole method to doing a child's room. It's very simple, though. 
then when they wake up, even in the middle of the night, many parents, there's lots of YouTube videos of this too, the child will crawl over to the shelf in the middle of the night and they fall back to sleep on the rug. <laughs> and the parents come in and they're in the middle of the floor. You know, but they're fine. You know, we just put them back on the little floor bed. It's encouraging their independence and it's showing they really do like time alone. You know, if, if they're able to, to um, be active and, and choose some work. are huge. You know, I would look at what's happening. Did, did dad just come home and, you know, the child was only had 45 minutes with dad and they want more time? Did they not have a lot of time outside? You know, look at all of those things and see. It's, it's usually a lack of movement that they're just not exhausted at the end of the day. So I guess I mean, not even takes them a long time. It takes them a long time. And it takes a long time until they do it completely on their own. So it really should be a cooperation. You know, it, what what part do you need help with? And that's part of the, the Montessori approach is instead of doing it for them, to see exactly what amount of help they need. I, 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 I can't leave tonight without sharing this. It's my favorite story of Dr. Montessori in her early, she had no idea you know, about young children. And she noticed in this first group of children, as they were starting to concentrate on materials, and they were showing this tremendous concentration, the two women that she had hired to be with the young children would just come up behind the children, who had mucus coming out of the nose, put their hand behind the child and wipe the nose. And the children would be startled, because they weren't saying, I'm going to wipe your nose, and it would break their concentration. She saw this over and over. So she thought, Hmm. One day, she noticed a little three-year-old with all this mucus coming out of his nose. And she said, come with me. And it was a big deal that she had gotten up out of her observership. So she brought the little boy over to a mirror. She took out a handkerchief from her pocket. And very slowly, she looked at herself in the mirror, very intently on her nose. Very slowly, she wiped one side of her nose and folded the handkerchief. Wiped the other side of her nose, folded it, wiped it, then looked to see if her nose was clean, and put the handkerchief in her pocket, and then she handed a clean handkerchief to the little boy. He did exactly what she showed him, very slowly. And she didn't notice that, but a, a group of children had gathered around. And when he had cleaned his nose, they broke into applause. <laughs> and she thought, dear God, what are we constantly doing for children? that they just want us to show them how to do it. And about a month later, a four-year-old said to one of those women, don't do it for me, help me to help myself. And that became one of her parents, help me to help myself. So we're always looking for how much help do they need. They don't need us to put on their whole jacket and zip it up. Maybe they just need us to hold the part at the bottom or to show them very slowly how that stem goes in. Or is it the environment itself? Are they not hooks low? Are they not di you know, dishes low? One of the things she would say to parents is walk through your house at night when your children are asleep and ask yourself, what am I doing for my child in this room that they really could be doing for themselves? I remember one mom coming back the next week for a series of these classes and she said, Maggie, for months I've been yelling at my daughter, stop climbing on the counter to get the cereal bowl. Stop it, stop it. She said, it never occurred to me. That's the only way she can get a cereal bowl. She's three and a half. Why don't I put the bowls where she can reach them? So that's what she did, issue over. You know, there's so many things we just don't think about that Montessori said, if I could, I would build a room made for giants. And I would have adults go into that room and I would be behind them saying, go, go, go. And when they can't reach a doorknob, she'd go, what is the matter with you, go. And when they're sitting on a chair and their legs are dangling and it's uncomfortable, she'd say, sit up. You know, she had this whole daydream, like, it'd be great. And it would be like a day in the life of being a child. You know, almost nothing in our homes welcomes children. Nothing. I had to, this is another short story, but I had to go to the Disney World with my husband a number of years ago. He had a conference. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but now in Disney World, they have child-sized toilets and sinks. 
Well, I heard this mother in the bathroom, the child was washing her hands, and this mother said, I hate coming into these bathrooms because all he wants to do is keep washing his hands. <laughs> but poor little thing, finally, he can do it himself. This is what he wants to do. You know, and, and that, that same trip, um, talking about the, the reality baseline, the same trip, this couple, of little boy was into the main part of Magic Kingdom, and I happened to be about 20 feet behind. And he sees the ducks in the water, and he grabs onto the rails of the bridge, and he looks down and he says, duck, duck, duck. There are about six or eight ducks. And the parent, yeah, duck. And he starts, duck. And he was so excited at the ducks. And then the dad says, Cameron, come on. And I thought, oh, no, oh, no. I just started praying. I was like, please, no, please, no. Cameron, come on. Duck, duck. He's, just, he's so excited. The father got down in his face and he said, I didn't pay $5,000 to bring you to Disney World to look at ducks. I almost grabbed the guy by the throat and said, no, you pay $5,000 so he can see a man dressed up as a six-foot duck. <laughs> <laughs> the simple, real things, really. And it, it's us that we just don't know that. We think to be a good parent, you know, we have to be doing all this stuff. Really, it's just allowing, you know, ourselves to be formed by them, to enter into their really simple, simple life. Yes. Development of premature children? Mm -hmm. Yes. There, um, there's a whole, in the zero to three training, there's a lot of, of ways to touch the premature child because they don't like to be stroked like a child who would, a, a premature child didn't have all of their sense, sensory perceptors exploded by going through the birth canal. They were too small, so they didn't. So there's a whole protocol of, of when you touch them using pressure rather than stroke until they're older because they can't really feel that and, and it almost feels like a bug on their arm they like there's a lot of infant massage is great for premature children very a lot of pressure on their head because typically they didn't get that in the birth canal either um, but really just kind of giving them what they didn't get to. It doesn't. That's the good news. That's the really good news. It doesn't get reversed because this is the period of self-construction. So really, most children who go through Montessori go through the age of six. The two Google guys, they didn't go beyond the age of six. But they both said they believe it was their early years in Montessori that just helped them follow their interests. And typically, Montessori children, even if they're there till six or seven, they don't take no for an answer in a good way. You know, if someone says, well, you know, they just keep asking. They keep saying, well, how can I, how can I do that? They, they keep forging ahead with their interests because Montessori said, show me the six-year-old and I'll show you the man. That's how much development has taken place. And the people in her time knew that was a, a, a twist on St. Thomas Aquinas' statement, give me a man in his first six years of life and I'll give you a saint. That's how much development takes place. Our, our personality is formed by sex, and we just don't know it. <laughs> so I, they, they have very little trouble transitioning if they go to another school. Usually the, the directors will find out what school they're going to, and they'll show them, oh, in this school, you're going to have to raise your hand if you have to go to the bathroom, you know, and we'll just go through and explain 